Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is the fifth in a series of weekly online webcasts that IIDA headquarters is producing to further connect our community of members. I'm John Zornecki, Deputy Director and Senior Vice President of IIDA based in Chicago. Welcome to today's talk. We have a great response for this talk with nearly 1,000 of you watching from home. Wow. So welcome. And also welcome to the four hospitality design professionals that are here with me from around the country. They're all with firms with multiple offices. And our discussion today will focus on hospitality, the design of restaurants, hotels, and the hospitality industry. Even if you are not a designer in the hospitality sector, you enjoy going to restaurants, you travel, and you stay in hotels. And you're certainly interested in the future of the hospitality industry, which has been hit hard and which is an important component of the economy. And I know that the designers speaking today will all offer lessons that can be applicable to the design of other projects as well. This session is approved for continuing ed and there's a slide that's going to come on the screen, I believe. There it is. Uh, it's approved for one CEU from IDCEC for interior designers. Further information is on your screen right now. Send an email to CEU at IIDA.org if you did not already input your member number when you registered online. Take a screenshot of this if you need the email address. All right. And then let's get started with our conversation. Um, we have, let me just introduce who we have before they talk a little bit about their own firms. We have Adam Farmery, partner with Avrico, based in New York. We have James Lee, Director of Design Hospitality with Leo A. Daly. He's in Los Angeles. We have Margaret McMahon, Senior Vice President and Global Director of Wimberley Interiors in New York. And Meg Prendergast, IIDA, she's Principal at the Gettys Group in Chicago. So welcome to all four of you. Um, let's get started. Adam, Avrico, uh, you're based in New York. You have offices in San Francisco, uh, as well as London and Singapore, right? Bangkok. Bangkok. And so tell us how Avrico is doing as a firm. How are your teams doing? I think that we're doing okay, all things considered. You know, the, the design business um, is, is very much a people-focused um, business. And, and I think the thing that we've done probably the best thus far is to just try to keep that in mind, to try to make sure that we, we remember that the people that are within the family are all, um, are all important parts of what make us who we are. So, you know, we've, we've had to do some of the same things that a, a number of other design firms and, and other businesses have had to do, which is, you know, reduce the number of contractors that are, that are working for us in all the offices. We've unfortunately had to furlough um, a small number of staff, but uh, even that, it was really important to make sure that we um, were furloughing the staff so that they, they could still receive benefits. We still were able to cover their benefits for the next three months. Um, there are subsidies out there that we made sure that we connected them to to make sure that they could continue to to uh, receive some uh, monies from the governments um, and that they stay on our books. You know, I think the, the other thing that we've done is that my partners and I have all decided to um, also um, not take any pay over the next three months as well so that we can really eat from the same table, which is something that we believe really strongly about. That's uh, there's difficult decisions, obviously, and, and yeah. thanks for being candid about that. Um, Meg, here in Chicago with Gettys, tell us how your teams are doing. How is Gettys as a firm doing? You know, Gettys is uh, in a fortunate position right now. Um, and yes, it's been a challenging time. Um, our headquarters is in Chicago. So the majority of our team members are located here in Chicago. And we went from a, a very bustling headquarters on a day to day basis to everyone working from home, of course, as everyone is. But I think the thing that we, our takeaway is uh, we've been fortunate enough not to, we have not furloughed anyone, um, but we have taken time to really 
uh, listen and uh, give people the space they need to really figure it all out. And, and one thing that I might, one of my takeaways has been that, you know, people experience this whole new world order at different times and in different ways. So just from a, from a business practice, we're cooking along and we're making things happen. I know we'll talk about that a little bit, but um, I, we, we really are trying to really watch out for our people and our team members to make sure that they feel engaged and they feel like what they're doing is important still and that they have, a, have places to reach out and talk to people and, and have an ear to be listened to at various and sundry times. Mm -hmm. Good. Margaret, you're in New York. Your firm yes. is, uh, your office is in Manhattan, but you're at your home in Brooklyn. Yeah. How's, how's your firm doing? How is, how are your teams doing? Well, um, it's interesting. So we have offices in LA, New York, London, um, Singapore, and Shanghai. And um, it, it, listen, it's a global economy and you've got to watch where the money is moving. And each office has had different experiences. Um, our Singapore office just doesn't even have enough people to do what it is that they need to do. Um, London has furloughed some people. Actually, London, New York, and LA, we furloughed. And really, it depends on the project type and where you are in the phases of your projects. Um, New York, we have had, uh, I would say, a significant number of projects go on hold. Um, we have a new build in New York. We have a couple of renovations in New York. Um, and anything that's not in the ground yet, people are holding off on and they're being very um, conservative. But we have had some accelerate. But every day, I, I feel sort of like I'm a traffic cop. Every day, something new happens. Um, some really good, some not so good, some that surprise me and some that don't. So I think that we've got to be really nimble. We've got to be able to course correct. And you know, what Meg said and what Adam said, what's most important to me is, you know, especially in New York, I have um, designers that are from other countries. Um, they're not with their families. They're in small apartments. Uh, they've never experienced anything like this before. So the best thing that I can do is just give them honest, authentic advice and just be very, very honest with them about I, I don't even know what's gonna happen next. So we're really playing it day by day um, and trying to be super thoughtful about what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Margaret. And James, you're in LA. You're with a large firm, Leo A. Daily. We know that Leo A. Daily has a number of different project types. How's the firm overall? How's the hospitality team that you lead? I think it's, uh, I think, all of you guys actually capture the uh, a, a sense of you know what's going on in hospitality uh, interiors. I think Leo Daily is a firm. Yeah, uh, like Mick said, we've been actually quite fortunate uh, because uh, we have you know different market sectors, right? We've got you know healthcare, you got institutions, federal governments too, and now the hospitality. Um, but just to be you know, just to, you know, to focus on hospitality itself, um, you know, we we were. Little nervous, of course, you know, when this whole pandemic, you know, hit us, but actually I think we were blessed to work with a great, uh, you know, the clients to really actually get the projects moving forward. Um, we, we did have a, a few projects that are on hold, but they're coming back up right now. But from a, um, our team standpoint, um, we actually do uh, uh, the WebEx every day. <laughs> and what we did is to actually get the, the WebEx video on live so that we can actually have eye to eye you know, conversations and make sure everyone's doing great health-wise. And then, mm -hmm. you know, you know, check in on the designs and projects and managements or, or what have you. So, yeah, so far, yeah, so far it's been good. But uh, like Margaret said, you know, we're, we're looking at it day by day as well too, right? Uh, you know, we're, we're being a little conservative about how we want to, you know, proceed forward with, uh, you know, our, our staffing and, and how we go about projects and, and how we're delivering as well too, right? So, but, you know, other than that, uh, like I said, I've been very fortunate to, you know, keep the projects moving. And part of the fortunate aspect when you and I had talked previously is that because you're with a large firm that helps and because Leo Daly has a number of projects that are in the government sector, that helps the firm overall, right? Can you talk about how that diversity is helping uh, the difficult economy that we're in right now, at least for your firm? 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's interesting because I'm I'm quite new to Leo Ideales myself as well. You know, I was I was with the uh, you know hospitality interiors firm, you know, such as HP and Wilson for a long time. And uh, when I joined the firm, it was you know we have like like I mentioned, we got a you know healthcare department, and where um, we're right now, we just launched a new model where we're converting uh, some of our hotels to hospitals, right? So we've looked at the model, how we can actually take the existing model to a convert it that takes, okay, how much is it gonna be, right? And how long is it gonna take to, you know, um, convert it? And how long is it gonna convert it back to the hotel so that, you know, guests will be able to feel safe to be able to, you know, go back there. Um, right now, we, we actually are working with the, uh, the Nebraska right now to launch the, uh, one of the first biometric um, patient care units. Right, so we as a hospitality designers are learning quite a lot about it right now in terms of the healthcare standpoint. So we'll be able to actually adapt that model, um, you know, moving onward, so that we can actually design a uh, the future rooms, if you if, if you will. Right. So we um, actually launched a new model. Um, my colleague Mark Brad, um, we as a group are designing a feature uh, guest room right now. Um, and it's quite a, a interesting to hear from our designers about all these ideas, right? Mm -hmm. you know, we're always, you know, uh, focused on, you know, design standards and and uh, the, the trends or, or what have you, but really just trying to design ahead as far as what that's gonna look like. It's quite interesting because we're gonna try to, you know, uh, design a room out of nothing really, if you will, right? And we're gonna try to come up with a spec how long is it going to take? How much is this going to cost? So we can actually implement it in the future, right? Um, so yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of interesting aspects that's happening with Leo Daily at this junction. And yeah. So for the audience, just want to make a note, we are fielding your questions as we go along too. So feel free to input a question if you have it in the Q&A box that's at the bottom of your screen. And I also want to make sure that we um, get a, a good sense of, of the firms that we have here. So we, I think some know of Avrico. I just learned last week when we chatted, Adam, that you're also doing some workplace projects. So give just a, a small snapshot of what is Avrico working on now in terms of the range of hospitality, some workplace, what are your major clients? Sure, um, we, you know, the other thing that we were talking about um, prior to going live was that we, we, we as, a, as a company also, we, we have design firms, but we also um, own and operate some restaurants. And, and although we're not going to get into that particularly right now, what, what it's led us to think about as designers is that we think about design in a very um, operational way. And it allows us to think a little bit more laterally about why we're making decisions in a design project. And I think that type of hospitable thinking is what allows us to then approach other sectors and other typologies of work and then apply that same hospitable thinking to that. So whereas the easy versions are things like members clubs where there's a, a decidedly um, hospitality or food and beverage bend to it, it, it also um, has led us into projects like we're currently designing the, um, the campus for Expedia outside of Seattle, which includes all of their workspaces and all of their function spaces and all of their hospitality spaces. And, and Expedia are an extremely um, forward thinking company in terms of how they're interested in running those workspaces. And so they turned to us to try to use somebody that's not a classic, typical workspace designer to sort of bring some new ideas to the table. And we're doing, we're doing that with Sixpedia. We're doing some projects with NBC uh, out in California, um, a large automotive manufacturer in Detroit that starts with an F and ends in a D that I'm not allowed to talk about. But <laughs> you know, there's, there's lots of really interesting projects that are not your typical kind of you know, bread and butter hospitality space. That's interesting. And Margaret, a quick snapshot of say the client base you can feel free to drop names of, of major clients that you have, just so our audience is aware of what you're working on. 
Well, it's it's interesting because when, especially when you look at how this has affected everyone gaming, um, we have some gaming clients that are um, obviously confidential. Hospitality and the hotel sector is mainly what we do. What we've been talking about is um, Belmont is a big client of ours and our London team um, is designing, has been very successful in designing a lot of the train cars for them. And when you start to think, I, you know, I do love the corny saying, necessity is the mother of invention. And when James says that he's, they're starting to design rooms that don't even exist, I think that we're going to start to look at travel very, very differently. Mm -hmm. um, and this morning I did, a, I did a post of one of my boards about travel. And I said, whether you're in a car, in a train, or a plane, you can still really enjoy that. So for mm -hmm. us, we're working with um, Belmont. We're working with all the major brands right now. Um, and we're in gaming as well. A little bit of residential, um, but we don't step into the healthcare. And the other thing I think this is very interesting, um, which James was talking about, you know, healthcare looked like they were, they were trying to layer in hospitality. And I think what's gonna happen is that hospitality is now gonna layer in healthcare. So I think that we're gonna see um, a big shift and it'll be really, really interesting. And, Listen, this is a terrible time for everyone, but there could be some really exciting, innovative results that come out of all of this. Mm -hmm. We're gonna talk about design in a, in a minute. Meg, I wanna let you give a snapshot on the project base, your clients. Tell us who you're currently working for, uh, the, the client base that Gettys has in hospital. Yeah. Sure, um, thanks, John. So Getty's is multidisciplinary. Um, we start with hospitality, but you know we are involved with our own development projects and brand design, and we uh, have a procurement arm, and then we, of course, focus in all levels of interior design. So just thinking in terms of a snapshot, I know all, all of us on, on screen can, could go on for an hour about all the things that we're working on, but um, one, one key thing in terms of the hotel market place where we play most often is um, we have, you know, our core brands that we work with, the Marriott's and the Hilton's and the, in the Hyatt's of the world, we've got a great Marriott uh, renovation and repositioning going down in San Antonio, which is a fantastic market. Really. I really particularly love these um, uh, and no slight intended by saying that secondary and tertiary markets are one of my favorite markets in which to play. I think they bring a really rich, um, showcase to hotel projects to, uh, when we work there. And then uh, we have a, one of the most positive things are we have projects that are still moving forward and are, are queuing up to open uh, this year. So we have a project that's really having to look at how to very quickly pivot in this era. Um, we're planning on having it open in, in Nashville in July. And so we're doing a quick session with the ownership groups through our, with our own development team. How do you like address some of these concerns that we're all gonna be talking about today, be it food service or rooms cleaning or public gatherings, all those things. And how do you make it happen really super quickly when you already have something already in the shoot? So mm -hmm. we'll be working through that. And then of course, we also um, tend to um, play in the multifamily residential market. Um, that big project is is moving forward um, as full steam as construction crews can can move forward these days. And that's, of course, as John will know, the, the Tribune Tower conversion from the historic Tribune Tower on Michigan Avenue to Ultralux um, condominium project. And that's due to cruise through this year and, and open early next year for um, ownership. So, um, and then we have new work coming in. We did a bunch of... Um, uh, development with Hilton for their new brand Tempo and we hope to see some of those things coming online as real projects pretty soon and uh, we actually have a we ha I had my first uh, virtual project kickoff um, last week with a really cool project that's happening for an independent boutique in Detroit so Good. so you know, fun moving, stuff things are moving forward uh, despite the situation let me ask, uh, in this current state of the world, uh, a lot of you, I think all of you have uh, work, your firms have worked that are projects that are in other countries. Uh, tell us what you know from what you're hearing about either your offices or your projects that are going on in other countries. 
informing the audience about what you know about uh, stages of how the world is doing in Europe and Asia. Uh, Margaret, you want to start that off? Sure. Um, so our projects in China, and I, I said this back in November, um, China is still the biggest market. Um, and we've got quite a few projects going there. I think that we have a representative, we have a Shanghai office, and I was talking to um, Leo, our studio director there today, just asking how things are moving. And he, and he said to me for about five minutes, he's like, I get up at seven o'clock in the morning, I don't end until midnight, this is crazy, and you know, but I'm doing what I have to do, which obviously he, he is. Um, we're seeing a lot of proposals going. We have projects that are still running. I think that the issue that we're gonna see in China um, is that traveling within each province is not as easy as we think it's going to be. And we're not going to be able to hop on planes immediately and be able to just travel all over the world. So it's making sure that we have people teed up. But things are still moving slowly. They are moving slowly, for sure. Um, but we're definitely watching China to see how things move. London is experiencing the same thing that we are right now. Uh, Middle East, um, we're doing some of those projects and the planning stage is still moving. Um, so that's where we are right now. Adam? Uh, much of what Margaret just mentioned, we've been seeing as well. You know, uh, interestingly, Margaret made the point earlier that, you know, a couple of projects maybe in the UK uh, get a pause, but then all of a sudden you sign some new work out of Asia. For some reason, and I don't know whether you all experienced this as well, but during 2008, during the credit crunch, it was very similar. You know, a lot of the work in the United States and Europe kind of seized to almost like, oh, I don't know what's gonna happen. And yet it was really booming in Asia. And we had, we had just opened up our Bangkok office a, a year or two prior to that credit crunch. And um, we were fortunate because we were able to take some employees that were working in the New York office that all of a sudden had some of their projects put on hold and quickly kind of migrate them over to working on projects in Asia through the Bangkok team. And I think everybody on the panel is probably very similar today, right? Like the, the fact that we've now moved to this kind of virtual workforce is something that um, only benefits when you have the different nodes and you can shift workforces as necessary. As somebody also mentioned, I think it might have been Margaret before, like you have to watch the cash flow and figure out where the projects are still moving. And that's to some degree helped protect our employees, you know, having this kind of global presence has has a enabled us to do a little bit better than, you know, friends of mine that have firms in, say, the UK, where they're furloughing like ninety five percent of the staff. Um, so that's been we've been we've been very thankful for that. Mm -hmm. Right, we're we're glad to have a diversified approach and family of brands to do, you know, to add on to what Adam was just saying that. We have a lot of different eggs, different baskets, and sometimes we bundle them all together. And sometimes we have those all servicing different clients in a separate way. So that definitely helps us also sort of pull and push different levers throughout any given day, hour, week, whatever it might be. Yeah. James, do you know of any uh, uh, what's going on in Asia or Europe with Leo AD? As a firm. Oh, yeah, I mean, we, we have a uh, projects uh, where we're currently working on this uh, new lifestyle boutique hotel in Shanghai. And uh, in UK, we're working on Claridges. Um, it's, we're seeing different dynamics, right? Uh, they're both in different phases where actually um, uh, Claridges, uh, it's the suite exact um, renovations is actually in the CA phase versus uh, Shanghai, we're still in DD, kind of CD. Um, you know, as far as clarity projects is moving forward, actually, I, I was quite shocked, you know, all the subs and then contractors are there every day. Um, obviously, they're doing their health, uh, health checks or, or what have you. But one of the challenges we're having right now is just that the FFNE &E coordinations, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of them are, you know, the procurements and all that so is coming from the overseas, so the delays and the shipping and all that kind of stuff is, you know, causing a little bit of problems, but, but we're okay. Uh, but, you know, the, the projects that are in, in DD phase or CD rather uh, in Asia, you know, in fact, the client came back yesterday and said, can we look at the lobby furniture again, right? So oh God. <laughs> we're, 
yeah, oh, we're, gosh. You know, we're here to go back on, you know, it's like, okay. <laughs> Too much time. Yeah, right? Nothing better so, to do. So are they really? Well, it, it, it's for, it's, it's for um, it's good purposes, right? I mean, you know, clients are just being, again, mindful of, you know, you know, what's coming and how can we be prepared for the next pandemic if there is one, all right? But um, so, yeah, it, it's just, it's, I'm seeing a little bit of a different dynamic across the board. And then it's, you know, as far as, you know, going about a project or projects, uh, we're putting, like, like you guys said, we're putting the best talents for the most you know, suitable projects, right? Uh, like we are not really taking our projects from a regional standpoint, if you will, right? Um, but really, okay, who, which designer, which architect will be most suitable for a projects in, I don't know, you know what I mean? So it's yeah. been, it's been a, a good time. Let me ask you about that. You, you made an interesting point about a client that's asking for a change in their lobby. Is it because of the current situation that they're asking you to modify the design based on the world that we're in now? Is that why? I'm sure all of you guys would agree. I, I think um, I'm seeing a little bit of a uh, disappearing. I don't, I don't want to say disappearance, but almost like uh, we're not, they're not in favor of communal table anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, you know, there is, there is obviously the isolations between each, uh, you know, the guest or, or what have you, because, you know, at some point in our, our life, the, the residential design was one of the things in, in hospitality interiors where we're trying to be all communal on stuff like that or, or what have you. But, you know, we're looking at uh, the layout, right? Um, and we're also looking at, at the finishes. How, how easily can we clean this? And, yeah. you know, did it pass this code and stuff like that or, or what have you. So it's, it's all, another whole dialogue uh, that, that we're actually experiencing right now from uh, documentation standpoint so it's an interesting question that's being brought up by a client saying a project is in process and let's modify it based on the world that we're in that's interesting i i i want to get into design a little more uh and let's um start with the near term the world that we're in and then think a little more long term to a, a post-pandemic world um, but in the near term, this is the, the, I think, a little bit of a burning question for hospitality and returning to some semblance of, of normal. And that's your thoughts on how the business of restaurants and hotels can return to some normal. Yes, much of that will depend on the availability and accuracy of uh, virus and antibody testing, and that is not your world. <laughs> um, but your best estimates on the steps that are needed. Uh, let me put that question another way. Let's imagine that the governor of your state is turning to you as an expert on <laughs> hospitality interiors based on your expertise. What would your advice be in terms of the timing and capacity issues? How can places to gather reopen in a way that instills confidence in actually returning? I think Margaret has some thoughts on that. <laughs> it, it's it's funny. First of all, to um, to James, I'm going to go off piece for a second. When you were just talking, the one thing that I've noticed, um, I think while the cat's away, the mice will play, and I think that you know there there have been people furloughed even at the brands, and I think that owners see this as a moment where they can really sort of let loose. Um, while the brand may not necessarily be in the room. So that's one thing that I'm seeing. I, we've been talking internally and um, I very much look out of our industry first um, to see what people are gonna be doing. And I think the airline industry is where we all need to look first. I mean, they're gonna be looking at jamming an exceptional number of people in a very small tube and fly them across the world. So we're looking at different industries to see what they're doing first um but so our back to our governor um yeah. i would i would love to be able to meet with him to give him my thoughts <laughs> as i know all new yorkers would but i think that <laughs> listen i think that there are lots we all need to look to one another first of all i really believe that you know all the people on the panel i so respect 
every one of your firms. I wouldn't even begin to talk about F and B with Adam in the room. I'm clearly going to leave that to him. Um, but from a hospitality standpoint, there's lots of stuff that's already even going on in healthcare. It, it's um, mind bending to me. I was on a material uh, connection uh, seminar this morning listening. And when they're talking about um, mimicking plastic to the human skin and there's a zinc um, component to it and it's antimicrobial and antiviral, I think that so much of this will get to us because of other industries first. Um, I think the social distancing thing and F and B is the most important because people do want to go out and break bread together. So I'm going to toss it to you, Adam. I'm going to oh. let you finish that one. <laughs> uh, I mean, these are all, I think that you've got some really good points. I, I think thinking about the airline industry, especially how, how um, you know, if you think about post 9-11 and the airline industry and, and how for a very, um, what seemed like a, a long period of time at, at, at the at, at when it was happening, but it was actually a short period of time. You know, people were reticent to get back on airplanes for a little while, but within a couple of years, you know, it, we kind of came back to a normalcy. Now, I, I think you know, we've obviously my partners and I have, have all been talking about the restaurant industry intimately. Um, as you all know, you know, we have a couple of restaurants in New York that we had to close. Um, which was very, very difficult because we have people that have been working with us for 10, 15 years. My younger brother is actually our partner in the restaurants who's a chef. It's an incredibly hard thing to do. Um, but the, I think there's two sides of this, right? There's like a pre-vaccine side and then there's a post-vaccine side. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the near term, the pre-vaccine side is gonna be very difficult. It's going to be very, very difficult. You know, restaurants already operate on, on razor thin margins, and this has been exacerbated in the recent years as labor rates have increased and and uh, and real estate costs have increased. and And I think you're going to have venues that have closed on a dime. You know, restaurants are not supposed to go sixty to zero on a dime. You know, you can have restaurants that are going to come try to come back that have really big accounts payable lists because it's just gone through January and February, some of the worst revenue months in, this, in the season. So they're gonna have big vendor debt. They're gonna have inventories that they've had to get rid of and so they've lost money that way. Um, they're gonna have you know, likely large arrears to a landlord if they can't figure that out. <coughs> and then, then they're gonna be looking to do you know, best guess estimates 50% of the business, worst guess Worst case estimates, 20% of the business in terms of their gross revenues. If they're lucky, then it's going to be tough. You know, um, look, I think that there's some very bright people in the restaurant industry, and I think the restaurant industry entrepreneurs tend to be optimistic to a fault, and that's what makes them so special. Um, and I think the people that succeed are going to be those who plan to go back, not those that go plan to go back to work and just do things the way that they've been doing them. You know, yeah. they're going to, they can't, you know, they're going to have to think differently about every single step of their service model. And I think, I think that the, there are going to be people out there that, that rise to that challenge. And it'll be really interesting to see what they do, what, you know, what, what the restaurateurs um, come up with. One, one thing I saw, Adam, uh, which I think will, is, is so interesting and it speaks to what we were talking about um, a little bit earlier and the dynamic that dining out really brings to our just basic humanity yeah. is the, uh, there was a Harris poll out there, maybe it was last week or the week before that the number one thing that people miss in this whole COVID pandemic is dining out. Yeah. That is above seeing family members <laughs> going to the office, you know, whatever normal, activity that you might miss it is dining out so i think that this is a, a the restaurant it, the I, I love margaret's insights to the air travel industry i think the other the next notch on the tip of that spear is the restaurant industry because it affects so many livelihoods not only from a worker perspective but also from a socioeconomic perspective that we all partake in yeah, it's a good point, that idea about dining out. People are going, I was having a chat with my friend, Will Gadara the other day, 
who uh, was with Daniel Hum at uh, Levin Madison and the Nomad restaurants for so for so long. And he's got some really wonderful insights as well. And he's like, you know, when, when we're allowed out, people are going to want to go do special things. You know, it's that doesn't go away. Our need to kind of, to your point, sit around the fire as our, as our cavemen, you know, ancestors did and, and share a meal, you know, people are going to want to get dressed up. You know, like this doesn't change our humanity. No, so we're, we're, we're wired for something else other than staying home by ourselves. That's right. right. And Meg, when you and I chatted previously uh, on this topic of restaurants and hospitality coming back to business, there, the people aspect is so important to this. You pointed out that it's it's not going to be just flipping a switch and coming back, but noting the uh, the employee pool, uh, the manpower and staffing of restaurants and hotels to come back will take time to get back. And inventory resources may not quite be there for restaurants and hotels. So uh, there's multiple factors that will go into coming back besides simply opening the doors, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think, um... You know, there's, this is also an extraordinary time. And as Margaret was um, indicating earlier, you know, crisis breeds an incredible opportunity for design and, and innovation, right? So I think people are already displaying that just in the way that people are doing pickup and delivery of food or how people are even trying to stay in a hotel when they need to stay in a hotel. So there's very much innovative ways even happening, even from the, you know, the pre, pre-vaccine pre type of response mm -hmm. that we're all going to have to live through. Um, you know, <clears throat> I think about the reopening of hotels, existing hotels, much like opening a new hotel, in that you never do that really full throttle. You know, you're always opening a new hotel in sort of a partial soft opening kind of way to let that team get used to the, the way that that machine rolls and getting those systems really up to snuff again and, and to see what works and, and frankly what doesn't work and what needs to get course corrected before you're running a full house. So I think that's gonna be the approach for existing hotels moving forward um, to, to getting back online. Um, there's lots of strategies about how to make it um, appealing to guests wanting to stay there. I think one of the things out there in a, in a, in a big thought is trust. You know, how do we uh, Im imbue people with a factor of trust that it's okay to go and stay into my hotel or go dine at my restaurant or, or travel in a fabulous Belmont train car? You know, those things are going to be very important for people to consider. It's one more attribute of people making travel decisions that are gonna be really key. And so it'll be interesting to see how hotels are sort of, you know, messaging that or restaurants are messaging, messaging that to their guests and their, and their clientele. Uh, it's like uh, transparency of values, right? Like it's, <clears throat> it's literally gonna be, how can I, because everybody to your point is imbued with the same psychological weight of, of how do I feel safe? Right? right. And so that transparency is going to have to happen in both actual ways, like real physical ways, as well as metaphysical ways. Like how does that brand transmit that sense of transparency to you? Right. I, I think also too, the one thing that our governor has done, and I will say it again, um, Andrew, as my director of marketing <laughs> says, they're on first name basis together. But you know what, it's all of our responsibilities you know, he said, listen, you have to social distance. It is your personal responsibility to do the right thing. And I think that that's such a big part of, you can do everything you want in all the brands and everyone's trying to figure it out. You know, no, no one really knows yet, but everyone's trying to figure it out. And as long as we are all, um, I would say, really understanding and courteous and give each other the space that we need, that's, that's a big part of this equation, that everyone does the right thing. And in New York, um, people really get it, in, in Brooklyn anyway, they really get it. And if they don't have a mask on, 
you know, you're looking at one another and signaling who's going to go out the street, and who's going to stay on the sidewalk. So I think that's a big part of it. The one thing at F and B, Adam, that I want to see, like they have in London, I hope everyone can stand outside and drink now. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I'd love to see come out of all of this. Yes, <clears throat> like like the bar I was mentioning down the street from my apartment on Tenth Street in East Village. Right, right. It's it's a great vibe. It's a great right. vibe. You know what I <clears throat> what I want to incorporate into our next restaurant project. In a hotel most likely is the window opening. You know, there's something so neighborly about mm -hmm. going to pick up your lovely little snickety snack and pick it up through someone handing it to you through a window in a cute little bag. It's just, I don't know, there's something like just so friendly and so human to human about that that I, I'm gonna well, put a window you know, somewhere I, in my next I agree restaurant. with you, Mac. I, I think, you know, we're, we're all about, you know, designing this lifestyle, right? Right. And that, that is part of our lifestyle. That's our, you know, daily thing that we do is about, you know, going to your local or neighbor coffee shop so you pick up your coffee and you go to work or something like that, right? So that really truly become a reality into our hotel design. I mean, that, I think that'll be fantastic. Yeah, it's interesting because <laughs> that, design idea for everybody. that <laughs> aspect of the pickup window to get uh, coffee <clears throat> or whatever, it's heightening the uh, importance of the street front, the storefront the pedestrian experience and the sidewalk, which is interesting because sometimes we don't think about that related to interiors, but now it's a really important aspect currently at the moment. Let's think about the long term. Uh, for the projects that you currently have on the boards and projects that are <coughs> that you don't even know about yet, uh, I want your expertise on what you think might change in interiors, whether it's restaurants or hotels. Uh, James touched on it already that he has a client that is asking for uh, reconsidering communal tables uh, in a lobby. So how does the lobby change? How does the reception experience change? Materials, flooring choices, uh, adjacencies, proximity, sequencing, circulation, <clears throat> capacity, Seating groupings, ballrooms for Jesus, major John. Event. It's a long list. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Uh, is any of that changing? And if so, what what what's the most important thing that in your mind that might change? I'll, are you I'll dive in. Oh. I'm, 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 are, you, are you looking at Margaret first? No. <laughs> Which Margaret are you looking at? <laughs> <laughs> you're looking at John. Yeah, <laughs> Margaret. You know, I go, guys too. I, I go back to, and you know, to me, it's how you enter a hotel. And I remember when I was at Wilson, we were doing these big projects in Mecca and um, they're like, security is fine. Security is fine until there was an event. And suddenly we had to put the security portals in every single one of those hotels. And I was just looking at a device because I am obsessed and as my husband says, I hear what I want to hear. Um, I'm pretty obsessed <laughs> that going back to the office. So I'm, I'm trying to come up with plans. And um, Leslie Shamas, a client with Cannon Ranch, had sent this uh, cut sheet to me. It's a portal of ultraviolet light. It's like a security portal that you walk through, ultraviolet light, that cleanses off of all of the surface bacteria and germs. And listen, is that you know, fluff that I should be looking at right now. But quite honestly, if yeah. someone gave that to me, I'd be like, right on, man, I'm clean. <laughs> Everyone else on the other side of that is clean. I'm going in. So, uh, so that's, one, that's one good example. Good. Yeah. You're not uh -huh. going to solve all of it at once, but I think the big solves you have to get to, and it goes to uh, trust, like Meg said, I, how do I know that beyond that door, everything is okay? And for me, it's the ultraviolet portal so far. So that's as far as I've gotten. Meg, when we chatted previously, you we were talking about flooring choices, hotels, uh, can there be carpet, will there be carpet? And also there's a level of luxury, right? So in other words, hard, hard flooring versus carpet, luxury versus not luxury, what are your thoughts related to flooring choices alone? Well, I'm going to sound like I'm evading your question, but huh. 
I'm going to take it from a, <clears throat> excuse me, larger perspective to a certain degree, because we're already sort of starting down that path relative to, um, <clears throat> sorry, I haven't talked that much today, apparently, but um, we've already started down that path with having hard surface in guest rooms, right? And now it's even sort of creeping out into public areas, et cetera. So that equation's already starting. And so some of the actually happening nows are going to continue, be it LVT in guest rooms or whatever it is. I'm sort of a person who looks backwards to be innovative looking forward. And if you think about how modernist design started back in the late early 20th century, it really started from a health and security and cleanliness perspective through the TB wards. And you look and if you look at those old TB wards, they're the corbu interiors, they're all white with lots of light and brightness and the and the Breuer chair and you know all these things, right? That we all associate with clean and modern lines, which today we sort of think of as an aesthetic. But then it really was about the perception of cleanliness and the perception of ease of care. Mm -hmm. And so if you can appropriate that notion of what's, I think luxury is always in the eye of the, of the beholder, but it is also in the eye of someone who's looking for comfort and trust and an inviting environment that might have a different eye than it did eight weeks ago, right? Mm -hmm. So that just simpler interior might take precedence moving forward. We were kind of edging back into this maximalist approach, more is more, because what else did we have to do? We've done it all before, so let's add more stuff. Well, we might start pairing that back again, right? Because people aren't gonna wanna have the theatrical environments because that's where all those little dust bunnies and microbes and bed bugs and whatnot might be hanging out and that we don't wanna entertain. And Margaret's ultraviolet shield won't work out. So, yeah. you know, I think that's how we're looking at it. Like what is going to, what kinds of innovations will allow a guest to feel like they're getting a quality experience Mm -hmm. but still allow that operational staff and that guest to feel like they've got something that they can work with and operate and enjoy in a, in a safe way. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to piggyback, piggyback on a little bit of that that Meg was saying, because I, I think that that's a great way of looking at it. I think when, when my partners and I talk about this topic, we we're, we're making sure to kind of, you know, step back a little bit and to think about this a little bit more broadly. You know, right now, as everybody has mentioned, there's a lot of anxiety in the world. You know, how long is this gonna last? Is it gonna come back? You know, what's this gonna look like on the other side? You know, what's gonna happen to people that I love who are not doing well, whether physically or emotionally or mentally? Um, and a lot of that anxiety is going to continue in the psyche of, of guests. In, in, in the psyche of everybody in society, right? Um, I mentioned before about this kind of design ideology that we've been developing called hospitable thinking. And hospital thinking for us, it was a study of behavioral sciences and psychologies in order to try to identify which human need states we could best affect through our design processes. And what we've basically been able to dwindle it down into is what we call the three S's, which is security, surprise, and significance. Security, how can I manage a guest's anxiety? You know, significance, how can I make sure that this experience is meaningful in a, in a way to every single guest? And surprise, how can I delight a guest with something unexpected? Now, right now in the world, there's a huge amount of oversurge on, on you know, anxiety. And so there's a lot of attention being placed to the security side of the human need states. Like, how can I use all my design skills to address the security, but we can't forget about the other two. Right. Mm -hmm. I know one of my notes for today was, you know, how do you still keep joy in the equation? Yeah. How can we make sure that we're still creating delight moments? How can we make sure that we're still creating meaningful experiences? I mean, that's to the that's what the humans need as much as the as the anxiety being managed. You know. Yeah, I, think, I, I agree with you. I think that. The how are we actually taking an approach of a project? I, quite frankly, I think that everything will change if you ask me, right? Um, you know, how we, you know, take a stab at a concept and, uh, you know, we're, 
we're, we're all storytellers, right? And we set up a, a great uh, concept and storytelling to start projects. But, you know, from a guest journey standpoint, like Margaret, like you said, the moment you arrive to the hotel and how you check in, how you go to your your rooms and how you're utilizing your all day dining, and, you know, your bars or whatnot, everything that we're about to, you know, uh, design now will be a uh, revolution for us, I guess, right? Um, I think we're, we're taking this time very seriously to actually uh, think about all that, uh, uh, aspects Adam like like talked about and of course we have our trusted vendors <laughs> all across the world who's going to work with us to come up with this creative solution so that we can actually work together collaboratively to mm -hmm. come up with some sort of solutions and moving onwards. I think it's important to remember that there's pre-COVID and post-COVID. Yeah. Right. You know um, I personally think people have very short memories <laughs> right and you know, to, to create something just for this moment, as Adam and Meg have said, it's, it's going to be um, a bit of a mistake. And I think that for most people right now, whether it's a hard surface or soft surface or whatever it is, it's about the, how sanitized it is and how safe it is. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're dealing with right now. But um, I think and I'm probably one of those people that does have a very short memory, so I'm probably not the best um, focused person to talk about. But, you know, when, when they do look at statistics, they're like 39% of people polled are not going to travel any differently. Um, and then 59% are saying, yes, we're going to travel differently. And you've got, to, you've got to think of all of that. So Adam and Meg, you don't want to take the joy out of it. You know, you don't want to build a church for Easter Sunday, but no, you, no. you want to realize no, no. what people's priorities and real concerns are. Mm -hmm. that build a church for well, really Yeah, good. the, the <laughs> long term no, though I'm glad is, that. well, I have a big, I, I, there's, we have one hotel in Chicago that has had some great success with a, a repositioning of their public areas to be, you know, all things to all people at all times, during all times of day, return on investment per square foot skyrockets, right? Or so that public area experience is gonna change a little bit, at least for the foreseeable. It could just mean that you reduce the amount of FF and E in your public areas, you know, until everyone feels like they have a, a little yellow pill or a, a vaccine or what have you to feel better, right? It could be that we look to other industries, be it healthcare for sanitary stuff or even the um, office environments. Office environment furniture is coming out with some things that are telegraphing a different message than we have been doing in hotel public areas, which heretofore the the notion kind of in public areas was you could be there with a group or you could be alone but not lonely right you that proverbial communal table was a place where you could go out and you could hang out with everybody and not really necessarily talk to anyone but still feel you were in it when i look at office furniture they've got these um elements for their sort of um communal areas if you will that are um, separate but together, right? They're they're kind of these little boothy things that you can kind of hang out, but you still feel like you have your own space. Or like the American um, uh, Express Centurion lounges with their own little individual carols that you can hang out in when you travel. You know, those kinds of things that kind of allow you to be in public, but still have your own space, I think are gonna be some things that we're gonna start to to look at. And yeah, you're right. People have a have historically not had a long term memory when it comes to these major cultural crises, but they will have a, some things will have a lasting effect um, that we'll have to deal with. Building on what uh what you just mentioned, Meg, and what all of you have been talking about, if if there is any change in design, it relates to capacity, uh, where the hospitality interiors relate to certain seating capacities, and this. It's actually a question that's come in from a viewer that's building on what we're talking about. So are there uh, changes that you foresee related to um, seating capacity? I think of restaurants in New York, Adam, you and I talked about this, you're, you're literally seating elbow to elbow with a complete stranger and you're eating food. And uh, <laughs> so does that, and let's focus on a, post-COVID world, let's uh, keep thinking about that. 
does that change? Does your design for seating capacity, you're going to still fit the same number of people per square feet in a restaurant or in a, in a lobby? What are your thoughts? I think in the long enough, in the long enough term, no, I think that, I think the short term, yes, absolutely 100%. And I think that there's going to be advanced testing for antibodies and all sorts of other things. You and I were talking about this kind of weirdly dystopian world that might show up for the next 12 to 24 months in which you have the haves and have nots and people that are allowed to go into restaurants versus not. And there's going to be forced social distancing versus times of less social distancing. That is absolutely going to happen. And so for the next 12 to 24 months, it's going to be weird. But just to quote another uh, really good comment that, that Will Gadara had mentioned, restaurants are going to be perfectly in perfect places in the near term. And that's going to be okay. You know, it's going to be weird that, that you're not sitting side by side with people, but you're just going to be happy to be out. <laughs> you know? Right. James, in the post COVID world, again, you, you mentioned a, a client thinking about a change. Are there any other changes that you think might happen in your, the design of your projects? Uh, I mean, I agree with Adam. Uh, right now, we're designing um, the restaurant called Perla here in downtown LA. And uh, the, the whole discussion about actually two days ago, okay, to, what, what do we do with this uh, communal table? Um, and, and I think right now, like, like you said, Adam, um, we're, we're going to be, you know, like three feet apart or, or, or whatever. But I think that whole intimacy is going to come back, right? Um, you know, we're, when we design hotels or restaurants, you know, we, we, we go for food, we go for, uh, you know, the, the friendship, conversations, all that stuff, right? So it's just a matter of, you know, the tangible moment of your friends and the beloved ones and, you know, sharing the conversation. I, I think that's just going to come back. It's, and it's just a matter about, like you said, like. John, I'll add one more thing on there because I know we're sort of running out of time, but um, the thing that we haven't really touched base on is tech. Yeah. And its implications to our whole new world. And I think it has great applications. It's how we deploy it, right? I mean, I don't think anyone wants to just sort of interface with robots the rest of their lives, but that the, the robot that can go in and clean a room or the uh, voice activated sensors in a guest room or a, or a restaurant or how, to, how you deliver an order or whatever, all that tech is really gonna have a great deal of impact. I mean, Hilton, already has a, your own handheld can activate anything in the room, right? They've already rolled that out. So people are getting so much more comfortable with that. Um, I think that that will become even almost like what's the companion from a tech perspective that you might have out in that public area or in a guest room space or in a restaurant space that still is compelling and you don't feel like you're, to use your word in a dystopian world that you don't interface with humans anymore, right? What's that, what's that next step of acceptance to a more automated environment? It's very I interesting. Think, I think, you know, we're, we're currently working on, like I said, projects in Shanghai. And in Asia, you, you know, you see a lot of a, a, uh, you know, technology in, in the guest rooms as well as the lobby. Um, as far as, uh, you know, having your own barcode on your phone, and you can pretty much do anything and everything, mm -hmm. right? And that is, and I think cell phone is one of those things that you will not let go, right? So being able to actually, uh, you know, control everything or whatever you want to do, whether it's a Siri, Alexa, or, or WeChat or whatnot, right? It's a lot of uh, those, you know, voice activations. We see that a lot, and then uh, we're we're slowly implementing that here in the U.S. as well too. So I, I yeah. If so, if you look at what they're doing in China and how you can even travel through China, it's a code that you get on your phone, right? You know, mm -hmm. and I think Meg, when you talk about it. I've just been looking around my house and assessing my life saying, we have too much stuff, you know, why do we have all this stuff? I'm getting, <laughs> getting rid of like everything. And when you think about, I always test when I stay at a hotel, I always put the card where it's supposed to go for don't change my sheets. I hang the towels where I'm like, that they tell you to, to don't wash my towels. And, when I, and it never seems to work that way because I think that it's out of pure habit of let me go in and take the towels out, let me restock it, let me change the sheets, let me do this. I love the concept, uh, and people might be totally grossed out, but I love the concept that they don't even come clean my room for the time that I'm there. Right. Right. Except on request. Yeah, and I, I think it will be less waste. 
yeah. um, a more pared back service. It'll help the owner, it'll help with labor and everything else. So I think it's one of those positive things that might come out of it. So there's solutions related to tech, as, as Megan James pointed out. There's uh, solutions related to design, but there's also, uh, it's a people-centric industry. And it's about thinking about how people relate and how people connect and how people work uh, within an industry and how uh, the guest experience will be. This has been a really great discussion. One last question for each of you. Is there a positive note from your experience in this last month that you, wanna, you want the audience to know? Or is, are you aware, we know the hospitality industry has been really hit hard. Uh, are you aware of any financial support uh, mechanisms that you want to make the audience aware of, essentially ending on a positive note for for the audience. Um, Meg, do you have? Uh, uh, sure, we could we could talk about this for another hour, I think. But in in uh, summary, I will say that um, one thing I learned from the restaurant side of the fence uh, is that. If you're trying to help the restaurant industry, try reaching out to the restaurant directly if you want to order food from them because they've repositioned some of their employees to be delivery people or, or short order cooks or whatever it might be in, instead of um, you know, going through the Caviar or the Grubhub or the DoorDash or whatever it might be. And then I guess just on a super positive, hopeful note, you know, this week we just celebrated uh, Earth Day's 50th anniversary. And one of the things that I've found to be a silver lining um, to this whole thing is our blue sky factor. Because just the absence of humans, literally, have, been, have resulted in uh, bluer skies, less pollution, animals wandering down the streets of Chicago and LA and Manhattan and uh, Brooklyn and Tuxedo and all sorts of things. So. You know, this, the pre premise of we couldn't possibly do that because of X, Y, Z is already, hmm. it's already happening. <laughs> How can we continue it, right? So we, we now know that it is possible to decrease air pollution in a relatively quick way, right? So how can we as design professionals, I don't care what design industry you're in, how can the design industry, and we're one of the most, the biggest contributors to world population through the construction industry, how can we still keep this, that part of it moving? So that's, that's, right. that's the opportunity that I'm looking for. Thanks, Meg. James, your thoughts uh, uh, ending on a positive note? I think uh, through this pandemic, I think it, it brought all of us together a lot closer, right? Um, you know, you know, Africa, the Gettys, and Wimberley, and Leo Daly, and any other our, our friends uh, in the industry really came together, including yourself, John. Thanks for, uh, you know, hosting us, of course, and be able to have this time to really share our opinions and in a thought process. So we'll be able to, you know, come up with something new, right? At the end of the day, we're, we're all hospitality designers, right? We like to, you know, give it back to the community and give back to the uh, uh, people who who can come in, be able to join, uh, you know, enjoy it, the spaces that we, we're designing. So I think it, it's um, we're gonna be a lot more creative. I think we're gonna spend a lot more time, you know, with our pencil and pen and doodling or what have you, to come up, come up with a great design so that you know people uh, and the guests will be able to you know travel without any any kind of anxiety or you know, worries and, and stress or what have you. So um, we'll be able to travel again very very soon. Let's hope, definitely. Margaret, your closing thoughts? Um, and I had a thought early this morning. So um, I think that one of the greatest gifts that you can give someone is the gift of travel. Um, I found it incredibly inspiring um, for me. Uh, I've been able to go into incredible places traveling through business and for leisure. And I think that we have to remember through this, this is a global thing. Okay, we have to remember how grateful we are that we're all on this call and we're all healthy. But we have to remember that there's a big, beautiful world out there. Mm -hmm. And that travel, I believe that the travel industry will make sure that we're safe and that we will all need to get out there and see the world as it is. And um, 
I just look forward to that day. I'm ready to go already. Yeah. Um, and I know I'm confident the travel industry is going to take care of us. Uh, right. So I look forward to that time when we're all out there together. Totally. Definitely. And Adam, before you jump on that Peloton next to you, you're uh, <laughs> yeah. Our closing portion of the program. <laughs> Last for anybody that wants to stay on. Uh, yeah, no, I, th I think it's really, it's been interesting the past month because, you know, so much of our time and energy during our usual workday, you know, is constantly dealing with the chaos and things pulling at us from a lot of different places. And although our work streams have still gone forward, um, it feels as though that a lot of those things are suddenly removed and we now have space, right? Space to be, to be thoughtful, to be introspective, to think about the future as we might like it to be, not as it has been as we've been plodding along. And I think, I think um, it's amazing that this is happening. And I, I, I think the biggest thing that we all have to do is to keep our eyes open and recognize it and make sure we don't miss it. That's great. Thanks a lot. This has been a really excellent discussion and I appreciate everyone watching uh, given uh, the, the times that we are in. And thank you to Adam, Meg, Margaret, and James for being great panelists today. One last reminder that this session is available for continuing ed credit. Uh, take a picture of that screen if you need to email ceu at iida.org for that uh, continuing ed credit. Thanks again to everyone. IIDA is doing this every Thursday afternoon at 2.30 Eastern uh, for the foreseeable future. So join <laughs> us again. Thank you, everyone. And Thanks, John. Thank Thanks, you. Adam. Thanks, everybody. Bye, guys. James. Okay.